Uh, today we're going to look at Acts chapter 3. Um, it's my turn. <laughs> One miracle is not enough. And I want to thank uh, Ryan especially because for those of us like myself who are technically challenged, um, he came up with this stuff and it's great. So Acts chapter 3. Um, William Shakespeare asked a question. He said, what's in a name? He said, a name implies more than just identification. It carries with it the idea of authority, of reputation, of power. And, you know, even among us, there's those things hold true. Uh, when I... At the end of this message, I have a video I'm going to use, and I especially asked Pastor John if it's okay, if he had any plans to use it, before I went ahead and just decided to do it myself. So there's authority, there's reputation, there's power, and some names carry with them an inherent authority. And you can all think, you know, president, premier, king, and uh, the most important name is Jesus, of course. I like the psalmist who said, I will praise thy name, O Most High, about the Lord. In verses uh, one, two, 1 through 10 of Acts chapter 3, kind of set the scene of what goes on there. If you look at verse 2, it says, A certain man, and we're not given his name, we're told that he's been lame from birth. And in Acts chapter 4, it tells us how long he's been lame. It said he's been there at least 40 years in that condition. Now, evidently, he's got some pretty good friends because if you're lame and you can't walk, for him to get to the temple meant that somebody had to take him. So he's carried there and set down every day in front of the temple by his friends. Uh, and then he, his job, what's his job? Begging. His job is begging alms. Um, it says that uh, he's in front of the gate called Beautiful. And the historian Josephus says that he wrote that it was a gate made out of Corinthian bronze and that it was exquisite workmanship. Not Corinthian leather, but Corinthian bronze. Um, if you, anyway, <laughs> that's all, that from a long time ago. Uh, so the, the lame man is in a strategic spot, right? He's right where he needs to be. And he's also strategic because he's at the temple and the Jewish people thought it was particularly meritorious to give alms, to give people help. So he kind of had, they put him in a good spot. And, but the thing is, he's probably not the only one that was begging that morning. Uh, actually, it was afternoon, but in verse 6, you see Peter's response to the lame man because he's, He's there looking for alms, and, and Peter says, well, I don't possess silver or gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazarene, walk. And what did he do? It says the miracle, it, it, that he jumped up, and here was a person who had never been able to walk from birth is leaping and jumping and leaping and praising God. He says, uh, the lame man got it right. Verse eight, verses 8 and 9, I like this. He was walking, leaping, and praising who? He's praising God. Now, he followed Peter and John, but he was praising God. Even though nobody knew his name, evidently, at least it's not revealed in the scripture, Verse 10, everybody recognized him as being the person who had been sitting 
laying there asking for begging in the, in the past. So everyone sees the miracle. And, you know, if we saw that, we'd be the same way. It's a big deal, right? I mean, somebody who hadn't been able to walk for 40 years, all of a sudden jumping around, it's a, that's a big deal. So everyone is filled with amazement, verse 11. Um, and verse 12, it gives us an indication that the miracle is a sign pointing to Jesus. See, Peter says, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? It's not our power, it's not our piety, it's not because we're extra specially good. It's because of Jesus that this man is walking. And Peter correctly corrects any false notions. I don't know that they were going to carry him off like they did in, uh, Pastor mentioned, Acts 14, uh, uh, calling them Zeus and Hermes and any of that kind of thing, because these were Jews and they were there at the temple to worship. But still, there was a sense that Peter and John, this was really special. In verses 13 through 16, you see that the source of the miracle was Jesus. Uh, he places the conviction where it belongs. And Peter is like, he's really direct. He says, you delivered Jesus up to the cross. You delivered Jesus even when Pilate wanted to release him. And he goes on and he says, you put to death the prince of life, whom God raised from the dead. I like verse 16 because it says, on the basis of faith in, in the name of Jesus, this lame man was not only healed physically, but also spiritually. How disappointing it would have been if the lame man had only been healed physically. I mean, he would, he would have thought it was great, but the being born again is more of a miracle than it is for a lame man who's never walked to be healed and be able to walk. Being born again is for eternity. And there's a lot of similarities, similarities between the lame man and us as believers. Peter's message to the onlookers in verses 17 through 26. At first he says, uh, I know you acted in ignorance. Kind of lets them off the hook, right? God offers, aren't you glad that God always offers his divine generosity? Because I need it every day, I don't know about you, but... Uh, the suffering of the servant Jesus that he endured at the cross, his resurrection. He can offer freely in his name the good news of the gospel. If you look at verse 19, <clears throat> something's required, and that is repentance. What is repentance? Repentance is a change of direction in our thinking. These are the same people that just a mere few weeks ago crucified Jesus. And now Peter says, you got to turn your thinking around about Jesus. A change in, might, in mind and heart. A change about God's perfect holiness. And a change in mind about how hopeless and helpless and unable we are to do anything without the grace of God. In verse 22 and 23, Peter quotes from Moses in De Deuteronomy chapter 18. And basically he says that the Messiah is coming. And then uh, verse 24 is kind of curious because he says, uh, he talks about Samuel. Now, Samuel did not write any direct prophecy about the coming Messiah. But who did Samuel anoint? David, King David. And there's a lot of promises about 
the coming Messiah that start off with King David. Jesus is the fulfillment of those prophecies, but Samuel did anoint David. Verse 26, Jesus uh, came to the Jews first as Abraham's promised seed. And even though they rejected him, they had a chance to do something about it. And God connected the miracle of the healing of the lame man to their need to recognize Jesus as their Messiah. He got their attention, right? <clears throat> they were on their way to the temple, probably 3 p.m. in the evening prayer. And it's like time to make donuts. <laughs> it's the same thing over and over again. We're going to do our duty. But God intervened in a powerful way here. And so he's getting their attention and bringing them to, full, like, guys, if I can heal a layman, I can do something with your life too. And he says that the, the Jesus' victory was for them, for you. So like the layman, I'm unable to get to God on my own strength. Like the lame man, I'm poor and bankrupt and able, unable to pay my debt of sin. Like the lame man, I'm outside the temple. I'm separated from God by a, a chasm that we can't ever reach. And like the lame man, it's only faith in Jesus that we are made right with God. And yet, it doesn't say anything about what happens later for the lame man. After the miracle and the elation, what happens? If, you're, if you were old enough to remember the difference in your life when you got saved, if, you're a little, if you were a young child, you probably don't have much of a difference, but... If you're a little older in life when you got saved, there's a distinct before and after that is pretty dramatic. I mean, I was 24 years old and it was dramatic because <laughs> I was dead and all of a sudden I'm alive. But we get caught up in the routine of life and we kind of lose track of what God did for us. There's a thousand and one distractions to get us away from pressing on to the mark of following Christ Jesus. I like what Peter said. He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And if I don't remember anything else, I want to remember that because there's no other place to turn except to Jesus. I did some reading. You know, when you preach once a year, um, you tend to over... I got more stuff than I could ever use in, in one sermon. So I spent, I spent like uh, a month trying to whittle it down. Anyway, <clears throat> I like this. It says, correct thinking about God and myself always turns my distractions from myself and to God. Correct thinking about God and myself will always turn my distraction from me to really where it belongs, and that's to God. I read some of uh, A.W. Tozer. I think uh, Ryan's got this up on the screen, but he said, contentment with earthly goods is a mark of a saint, which is right in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Contentment with earthly goods is a mark of a saint. It's good stuff. However, contentment with your spiritual life, your spiritual state, is a mark of inward blindness. Yeah, I know. So... <clears throat> 
I'm like, oh, yay. I told the, you know, pastor has these books he recommends, and um, I don't have one with me, but the first time I read uh, Calvary Road, I literally took the thing and threw it. <laughs> it's like, ah, enough. But it wasn't. It's a good book. He recommends chapters one through three, by the way. Um, <laughs> So life, people, circumstances, our past choices, how we view what's going on in our, with our friends and our family and our world. Even the thing called, I wrote, seemingly unanswered prayer. Is there, other, is there ever a prayer that's unanswered? I mean, there's, I was always taught there's three answers. But there's always an answer. They have a way of taking our eyes off of Jesus and the prize of serving him and putting them on ourselves. Now, <clears throat> unlike Pastor John, I do not have attention deficit syndrome. Yeah. Yet. <laughs> However... I got to share with you, I was, I'm reading, of course, I'm reading the scripture. I'm reading the minor prophets. And one of the minor prophets is the book of Jonah. And everybody knows the book of Jonah, right? I mean, it's like four chapters. It's, everybody's got it down. So God wants Jonah to preach to uh, a whole nation. So what does Jonah do? He runs the opposite direction as far as he can get. So God sends a great fish and swallows Jonah and he's in there for three days and three nights. And finally the fish, God tells the fish to vomit him up on the shore. He must look great. Yeah, by the way. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> Jonah uh, confesses before he's vomited, number one. Jo jo Jonah preaches to the whole city of Nineveh. And what happens? They all repent. It says in the back, in the end of, the, of Jonah, that there's 120,000 people who don't know the right from the left. And that doesn't mean they're stupid. It means they're young. So it was a big city. So Jonah should be thrilled, right? I mean... What preacher wouldn't want to see 120,000 people get saved just like that? But what does Jonah do? Yeah, he's whining to God because God doesn't know what he's doing. Think about that. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I'm stuck with Jonah who had a genuine connection with God, was used mightily of God, and... We thought God was wrong. And then the Holy Spirit says to me, yeah, <laughs> Gene, have you ever done that? <clears throat> and of course, I say, I say to myself, I've never blamed God. I've never thought he was wrong. <sighs> I've never <laughs> held on to my resentment and my, my disappointments with God. And then I like, who am I kidding? <laughs> of course I have. You don't like to admit it, but, <clears throat> you know, I always was, I was thought that I was like, if I'm going to complain, I might as well go to the top. So I go to God right there. So my buddy Tozer, he says, the truth is that no ex spiritual experience, however revolutionary, can exempt us from temptation. The lame man had a revolutionary experience. The rest of his life was a battle just like you and I have.
And then he, Tozer says, the purified heart is, is obnoxious to the devil. His forces will not rest until they have won back that lost ground. The purified heart is obnoxious to the devil and his forces will not rest until they have won back that lost ground. Anybody know what he means? You make one step forward and what happens? Two steps back. It's like that's an old Chuck Swindoll book, but <clears throat> that's what happens. You make some progress and, and the, de uh, the devil says, hey, get back over here. <laughs> it's a big deal. It takes work. I think this one should be on the screen. Progress in the Christian life is exactly equal to the growing knowledge we gain of the triune God in personal experience. How's that for a mouthful? Couldn't have said it simpler, could he? Um, progress in the Christian life is exactly equal to a growing knowledge about God. And what does he mean? Well, he doesn't mean just a head full of Bible knowledge. He means a transformed life. Breaking the hold of the past grievances, of past disappointments, of unwillingness to forgive. I know none of you have ever had those problems. Um, the truth is that every believer is what we, we become what our desires make us. And here's another annoying verse. Matthew 6, 21, Jesus says, for where your treasure is, there will, you, there will your heart be also. So I have to ask myself, what do I treasure? Oy vey. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I take... I take karate, and, and Heidi Ochiai is the head guy for our form of karate, and he does Zoom classes. So the second half of the Zoom class he does, he writes out all the Japanese words in Japanese, and then he puts the English, thankfully, next to him for the titles of everybody. So around 500 BC, there was a king who thought he was really special because he had a very large precious stone, say a diamond. And he's interacting with another king. And the other king said, oh, well, that's nice, but what I value are my advisors and my fellow, the people I work with day in, day out. And Heidi Ochoi just says right on the screen, Who, what do you treasure? So I wrote him back and I said, that was definitely my favorite story out of Chinese history. <laughs> so again, if I'm honest, sometimes I have to wonder, what do I treasure? So I, man, you know, I treasure my preferences. I treasure my comfort. I pre treasure my convenience. And I also sometimes treasure let somebody else do it. Um, you all know Psalm 139, 23 and 24 says in part, search me, O God, and know my heart. And I find that if I ask God to search, he will reveal things that he puts his finger on. So what do you do when that happens? Um, if you read Calvary Road and listen to Pastor John, you got to bring it to the throne of grace and let the blood of Christ wash it away because you're hanging on to stuff. I'm hanging on to stuff that I shouldn't be. And as I said before, sometimes those kind of things, they don't give up in one try. 
I know, I don't know, you know, you have to do it over and over again. And if you're, you have to be meticulous about this because if you let it go, it starts to build back up on itself. So you got to break it down and say, Lord Jesus, I don't want this in my mind. I don't want this in my heart. I don't want this controlling how I think. Obviously, it happens every day. Every believer struggles with the, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Those are out of 1 John. And there's no exceptions. Contentment with our spiritual state is a mark of inward blindness. Are you content? I don't want to be content. You know, I love when Gary Ingram comes because he reminds us that we're all broken and hopeless and helpless without Jesus. And we need to get our lives under his authority and his spirit's empowerment. If you're dealing with something that's too big for you, ask for help. Pastor John's here till the end of the year, so make an appointment. <laughs> yeah. Pastor Dennis is here, make an appointment. But don't let it just continue to allow you to ride the roller coaster. Salvation is a miracle of God's grace, just like the layman experienced. The remainder of this life is that we strive to be more like Christ. Is any, has anybody here seen the, uh, there's, you know, like the Marvel, uh, Marvel comic books, they make them in the movies these days. So there's like the Avengers and there's other ones. And one of them is uh, Doctor Strange, Doctor Stephen Strange. Can you put that up, Brian? And he says, it's precisely what this, the one on the right is talking, the one on the left. It says it's precisely what kept you from greatness. Arrogance and fear still keep you from learning the simple and most significant lesson of all. It's not about you. I cry every time I see that. <laughs> um, that movie's not spiritually significant, but that phrase is spiritually significant. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about God's glory. And the sooner we get out of the way, the better off we'll be. I think the, um, there's nothing more life transforming than when you begin to grasp but the God of the universe who created all things, the God who knows all and is all powerful has chosen to make you the object of his incredible love. Isn't that something? You think about all the attributes that we know about of God just the top three, all-knowing, all-seeing, all-powerful, creator and sustainer, God who had no beginning, which, I don't know, will we ever understand that? I, I don't know if I'll ever understand that. Maybe in heaven we'll get to it, but um, he loves us so much that he sent Jesus in our place. And he wants more than just, hooray, I got saved back on, for me, March 10th, 1974. So what have you been doing since then? Is what he says to me. You know, <clears throat> why, why is it that, you know, Pastor John alluded to this last 
Sunday at communion, but why is it that God left us here? We got saved, he could have taken us to heaven just like that. He could have, he could have had angels come and proclaim the gospel, but he left us here. Why? What are we here for? I got to teach uh, a little bit of Discipleship 101. And I taught about the church and about called the minister. And the simple, real simple version is the church is God's people, those who have been born again. There's a universal church, there's a local church. This is us, the local church. Called the minister is that According to the scripture, every believer has a spiritual gift. An ability that God gave you when you got saved. Do you know what it is? How many know what it is? You should. That's another thing Pastor John's going to preach on. What has God gifted and empowered you to do for his glory? Um, I want to share, uh, pastor shared this with uh, elders and the pastors, but I thought this was really, Brad Little is uh, the head of uh, Conservative Baptist Venture Church Network. And there's a little video about preaching the gospel to yourself, uh, which... I think it's very appropriate. Oh, I want to you know, one of the things that I'm really excited about in terms of Venture Church Network is our focus on the gospel. I think we can all agree it is the power of God to salvation and we know that it's the doorway that gets us into the family of God. We also know that it's a message we ought to communicate to people. But sometimes we struggle with that and we're not quite sure how that comes about. I want to remind you that I think one of the things that we can do that helps empower the gospel in our own life is to preach it to ourselves every single day. You know, I think of Philippians 2, and when I think about the gospel and what Jesus demonstrated in Philippians 2, is three things. One is the incarnation. He did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. In other words, he emptied himself. He surrendered all the benefits and privileges and rights and freedoms that he had enjoyed with the Godhead for all of eternity. And that's really the beginning of the gospel. In American Christianity, that's hard for us because we like our rights and our privileges. And yet Jesus demonstrates that for us, if we preach the gospel to ourselves every day, it begins by surrendering all of our rights and freedoms and privileges and entitlements to God so that we can then step into the role of a servant, one who has given up a self-directed, self-sufficient life and we are committed, like Jesus was, to living out this mission as an ambassador for the gospel and for God. Obviously, with Jesus, he sacrificed, made the ultimate sacrifice. But in order for the gospel to go out, we're going to have to make sacrifices too and be obedient to the Father in getting there. And those three, th three things, I think, is what it means to preach the gospel to ourselves that we have to surrender our rights, we have to become servants and ambassadors for God, and we need to be obedient even if it means making great sacrifices. Because when we preach the gospel to ourselves, we never get above it. You know, the, the danger of looking at the gospel as just a doorway to get into heaven and something we proclaim to them could easily tempt us to think that we don't need the gospel on a daily basis. But it keeps us humble, it helps us set our priorities in surrendering our rights. It helps give us purpose and direction by not living a self-directed life, but denying self and picking up our cross and following Christ. And the gospel will only infiltrate a dark world when we make the kind of sacrifices that God leads us to make so that people can hear this life-giving message of the gospel. If we don't preach the gospel to ourselves, 
I think we're, we're in great danger of being comfortable in our own salvation. We can easily become critical and condemning of other people, and we lose our compassion to actually care for a lost world. Every morning I try to get up and rehearse the gospel in my own life because it keeps me humble before my Savior, it keeps me motivated to how I'm supposed to live, and it keeps me focused on eternal things. And I encourage you in your journey, keep preaching the gospel to yourself every single day. It is vital if we're going to fulfill the mission of Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's pretty awesome, wasn't it? Let's close in prayer. Father, just stand amazed at your great mercies and love. Lord, we had, uh, if we're born again, we have a, uh, an amazing, an internal miracle in going from being dead in our trespasses and sins to being alive in Christ. Father, I don't, I agree with Brad Little. I don't want to be stuck in the past. I want to be a growing and developing and maturing believer who loves God and loves people. So help us, Lord, to be obedient servants who sacrifice because we love you and we love people who need to know the good news of the gospel. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.